Chris Nikic, Chris Nikic just completed last month the Ironman Triathlon. Now, that's an amazing feat in and of itself. Let me remind you, the Ironman is a 2.4 mile swim in open waters, not a pool, open waters, where the rip currents and the waves are bashing against you, moving you all to and fro, um, oftentimes moving against you. I've done open water swims before. They are not fun, and they are not like swimming in a pool. 2.4 miles, then a 112 mile bike ride. Let me say that again, 112 miles on the bike. And you're not on a stationary bike in your gym. You're out in the elements where there's wind and, and um, much like we have today, the hot sun, you name it, it is beating against you for 112 miles. And then to top it off, the Ironman triathlon, you finish with a marathon. A marathon. <laughs> Let me say that again. A marathon. Oh. I've run a marathon over the period of two weeks. <laughs> I have never run one in and of itself all in one thing after riding the bike for 112 miles and after swimming for 2.4 miles. But Chris, Chris accomplished this. What makes it even more amazing is Chris Nikic is the first man to have completed an Ironman triathlon who has Down syndrome. Wow. wow. Chris could not walk, could not walk until he was four years old. And he just completed a triathlon, the Ironman triathlon. This spring, he will be invited to the World Championships in Hawaii to run and to ride and to swim the most famous of all Ironman triathlons in Hawaii. And he will, with his sheer determination and his diligence and his practice, he will complete his second Ironman. Absolutely amazing. He has been all over the news, if you watch the news, and I dare tell you not to really right now, but, uh, but if you do watch the news, it's always the last 30 seconds where Chris is on, right? So take the news and then watch the last 30 seconds and hear the feel-good story about Chris. He just received his medal from his first triathlon, Ironman triathlon, and he always said to his mother that when I get a medal, my first medal, I will give it to you. And this week, this week, three weeks after completing his Ironman, he gave the medal to his mother. Amen. And it was absolutely heartwarming and beautiful. You know, it's an amazing story to hear about Chris. But I think what's even more amazing about this young man is the heart of, of love that he has. It is just incredible to hear and see him speak about why he is doing what he is doing. He is so determined to share with the world that even though he has Down syndrome, that will not hold him back from being who God created him to be. Nothing is going to hold him back. He's going to do everything he possibly can to accomplish what he sets his mind to and what he wants to get done and what he feels God is calling him to do and to be in his life. He is an example, not only for all families who have, have children with Down syndrome, but for each and every one of us. Each and every one of us has been gifted in so many ways, and, and we are, like Chris is, called by God to utilize those gifts to promote the kingdom of God, to share the gospel, to love others, to reach out to those who are hurting, to seek forgiveness when we do wrongs, to act humbly, to pray, to worship, to be full of joy, to give a medal to your mother. And I tell you all this because the gospel today, the parable of the talents, is not Jesus' treatise on capitalism. The parable of the talents is not a parable about investment futures. 
and how you should meet with your banker this week so that you can make as much money as you can because that's what the parable of the talents is saying. I tell you, that's not what it's saying. The master has come and has given according to the abilities of the individuals five talents, two talents, and one talent. Not declaring their worth or how God sees them, but a, a talents according to their abilities. Each and every one of us has different gifts and talents, different skills, different ways of working and, and living and moving and having our being within the kingdom of God. And each of us is called upon to exercise those abilities and to multiply the gifts that God has given us. So the master comes and gives those talents out. Now a talent is probably about two to three years worth of wages. So to the one he gives five, that's about 15 years of wages. To the one that he gives two, let me check my math here, that's about six years. And to the one that he gives one is about two to three years worth of wages. It's no small chump change that God, the master, is giving to you and to me. But God freely gives this, and we then are called to do something with it. The one who has five goes and invests it, and he gets five more and returns ten to the master. The one who has two um, invests that and doubles it and returns four to the master. The one that has one, living in fear, living out of, out of the fear of, of losing just that one, digs a hole, hides it, and returns one to the master. And then we hear what, what the master proclaims. He takes the one talent from, from the individual and gives it to the one who had produced ten. You see, when, when we don't regularly form ourselves, that means practice prayer, read scripture like the collect of the day has, has commanded us and invited us to do. When we do not attend regular worship, either in person or digitally, like so many of us are doing at this point in time, when we don't serve others, when we choose to look to ourselves rather than to love others, when we, when we choose our way and not God's way, we oftentimes will lose the ability to live in God's grace and love. Not because God has taken it away, but because we can't see it any longer because we're not practicing what we need to be practicing to live an intentional life of discipleship. It's like any athlete would tell you. It's like any musician would tell you that if you don't put the time in and rehearse and practice, the skill will go away. I'm living and breathing that. When I get in the pool today, there is no way that I can swim like I did when I was younger. Why? Because I don't get in the pool as much as I, often, <laughs> as I did before, right? My body has changed and, and everything else, and I see still I still see friends that I swam with who are swimming competitively and are professional paid swimmers. I was watching on TV last night. So it can be done. But when we don't practice, then it doesn't happen for us. That's what I believe this parable is about. This parable is about Jesus telling us that it's, it's not good enough to just take the faith and hold on to it and cherish it. To treat it as if it's this fine, fine treasure and bury it. To hide it from others. When people at your workplace or in your life say, what did you do this weekend? You say, oh, well, you know, I did. And you kind of walk around it. But you know what? You're here this morning. Tell your friends that you went to church outside. It was beautiful. And invite them to come. That takes five talents into ten talents to say that. When you scurry around the issue and don't tell people about your faith, then you're hiding that talent in the ground. And if we do that long enough, then it becomes very easy for you and for me to not come to church, to not pray, to not serve the poor, 
to turn a blind eye to those who are in need, to, to actually not have civil discourse with those who are on the opposite side of us religiously and, and politically. All of those things, Jesus in this parable, I believe, is calling upon us to say, I have given you an abundance. Don't make it a scarcity. I've given you an abundance. Multiply it. Multiply it beyond all measure by putting it into practice. Love God. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. Serve the poor. Pray for others. Pray that God will bless you so you can be a blessing. Be a disciple of Jesus Christ, which means we have to attend formation classes. We have to worship. We have to pray. We have to serve others. There is no option in any of this. In any of this. Now that might seem pretty harsh. But I believe it to be true. And I've seen it to be true. Every Saturday morning. More and more people are coming to us. Not because we give out filet mignon. <laughs> not because we hand out the greatest food in the world. It is the same food that other food pantries buy from the food bank. People are coming to us because we see people first. When someone comes to us and say, says that they don't have a kitchen, we don't call them homeless. We call them people without a kitchen. They're a person first. We love people because God created people. And we are made in the image of God. And if God is love, then we are called to love others just like the people who come to us love us. And time and time again, we hear from people who come to us why they come is because we love them. We treat them differently than other food pantries have treated them. They're not a number. They're not a, a charity case. They're people. And because of that, people like Demetria from San Antonio College have joined us. Folks from the Seminary of the Southwest are thinking of coming and joining us. Over 40 people yesterday, ministers from this church, joined us to share the love of Christ with others. And I'm often asked, well, if I come, will, be, will there be enough work? Will there be enough work for me to make it worth it? And I always say, yes, there's plenty of work. There's plenty of work because when you begin to speak and talk to the people who come, we realize that they are struggling with many layers and layers and layers of hurt and pain. And they need somebody to walk with them, just like we need somebody to walk with us, to unpack all of that stuff and to put it in a bag and, and throw it away. Somehow, in some way, connect them to the services in our community. Somehow, in some way, connect them to people who love them somehow in some way connect them more deeply than a bag of groceries or a pair of new jeans or boots, all of which is extremely important. Because if we didn't do those things, we'd never have the conversations that we're beginning to have. The parable of the talents, my friends, again, is not a treatise on capitalism. It is a parable of our faith, of our formation, of our discipleship. It's a parable that calls each and every one of us beyond what we think we can do. To not hide, to not scour, and to not leave the, the abilities behind, but to grasp hold of them and take the abundance of God and multiply it. Multiply it so that our Master, our God, Jesus Christ, may be glorified more and more, not only in our lives, but in the lives of those we serve. Yeah. Amen. Amen.